needs to whistle, right? Should we try it? Okay. <laughs> whistle while you work. <laughs> the name of the sermon today is uh, this, Whistle While You Walk. So that uh, kind of whistle while you work. The city around us and the world around us needs a, needs a church with a, with a tune, with a melody in its heart, a church that's been touched by the love of Christ, people who have been filled with the love of Christ, who can bring that melody to the world around us. I, this week, um, there's, I do a lot of reading in the Word, but there's usually a passage that I have been meditati- meditating on, and there's a passage that, that I've been meditating on. And this passage I've known, of course, for years, and I've preached on it maybe 10 times. But this, this week, every time I read this passage, I, I, I began to cry. But I'm going to try and read it to you without crying because that's weird. But I, uh, it, there's something in this that's grabbed me this week. And it has to do with the song. Listen, it, it says, sing, O barren woman. <laughs> right? I don't... <laughs> you who never bore us a child. And so it's in, written to Jewish people that in their time of suffering, when they... When they uh, uh, being barren is one of the worst things to the Jewish world at, in this time that we could ever imagine. And he's saying, Isaiah is saying in Isaiah 54, in the, even the most dark time, even the most difficult time, sing, sing, burst into song, shout for joy, you who are never in labor, because there are more children than you can imagine. And then he says this, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer, sh- suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth. You will remember no more the reproach of your widowhood, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. Sing this song. Sing the song of joy, the song of love, the song of hope and peace and mercy and power and grace. Sing this song. If you were trained as a as a child going to church to be quiet about your faith, I'm inviting you to break the rules and sing. Let the presence and the joy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ erupt from within you. Burst forth, it says, in joyful song. A song that this world desperately needs to hear whistled in a a dark world. We have an event coming up on December 8 and 9, and uh, it is a song. It's bringing the message and the joy of Christmas to this city around us. And it's a, if you've you've been around, you know that we've got some pretty good musicians at our church, and it's pretty exciting. We're putting on a Christmas event, and here to tell you about it is our, our own Judy Homerest. Would you describe for us what's going on? Yes, and it literally is singing a song. And as you know, as a church, we are all about opening our doors. And think about this. Imagine two evenings, December 8th and 9th, where the talent that you hear every Sunday morning is channeled and unleashed in a whole evening of Christmas music. That's what's happening December 8th and 9th. And it's not only for us, It's a win on many levels. This is a time where it is so easy, so safe to invite your friends and neighbors to 
an event right here in our church that honors Christ. And we just want to welcome you. Next week, we'll have some handouts for you to give to your neighbors and friends, just inviting them. Non-threatening, people are looking for places to go for Christmas for concerts. But it's a win on other levels, too. As you know, we partner with Young Life and Wildlife. That evening, um, all of our ticket sales, tickets are $5, will be going to benefit a scholarship for a Young Life student. So we're partnering with them. Um, also, the night of the 8th, so mark this one on your calendars, we are having a silent auction from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock and then during intermission. And all the proceeds of that will fund um, Q, our wildlife Scott County director, um, help fund his position here at Bridgewood. How many of you came to the silent auction last year? Quite a few, and I know many of you participated and donated. And it was actually really fun. A lot of people partnered, putting together baskets and donating. Um, Emily donated something. Other people donated baskets and quilts. And, and so we're doing that again this year. We're soliciting from people in the community, to different businesses, but also um, right here. And this is really where it really comes alive. And so I invite you to join in and participate. Um, even coming that night, you can do your Christmas shopping. And um, so outside in the table, we have, we're selling tickets for the night, and we're also, there's information on donating to the silent auction. So it really is a night that is just a blessing, and we hope just to pack out um, both nights here in the church. So, Thank you, Judy. Yeah, thank you, Judy. Today we're going to take a look at uh, different forms of whistling. Now, we've talked about... Uh, uh, whistling through through the shadow of dark valleys, whistling um, even when things are difficult. We've talked we've talked about whistling even when the world around creates difficult things in our lives. The song erupting from us, a song of praise, of courage, a whistle of joy. Now, today we're going to talk about whistling in everyday life, just walking and whistling. What does it mean to be somebody who lives a character or has a character of the kingdom of heaven? And how, what is that song that we whistle when we go about our lives? It's, it's really, today, in our text, we're going to see s Paul address Roman citizens. And he's going to say to Christian Roman citizens that they need to have dual citizenship. Now, how many of you have uh, citizenship in two different countries? If you, if you do, raise your hand. I know David Coino does. I know uh, Mike Wall does over there. Yeah. He just became an American citizen. He's sta sitting over there. Doesn't he look beautiful? Did you not know he wasn't an American? Now he is. Dude, that's awesome. How many of you just became American citizens this year? You're the only one. It's incredible. Congratulations. But you are actually dual. You all have dual citizenships. It's not necessarily reflected on your... What do you call those things that you travel with? Those passports. It wasn't in my notes, so I didn't memorize the f word. You, you, you won't have this reflected in your passports that you are a citizen of heaven as well as a citizen of this country here on earth. But Paul is telling us there is a song of your citizenship of heaven that impacts how you walk here on earth as a citizen of the country here and here. You have dual citizenship, and our lives need to reflect that dual citizenship. So let's go to the text and let's see what God has for us. It's in Philippians 1, verse 27, and I'm going to read through verse 30. <clears throat> Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way, or another word is, Without being intimidated 
in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ and not only to believe in him, but that you also suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Remember, Paul is writing this to the church in Philippi while he is in chains, while he is in a place of suffering while he is tied to a Roman soldier as he is considered a prisoner everything dictated to him at this time he writes to them and he says what's granted to you on behalf of Christ you also get the chance to suffer for him wow does that sound like a song I'd like to sing oh I am suffering Everything is horrible. That's not what Paul sings. In fact, Paul, (laughs) Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. In this book, in this book in Philippians, chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Now, how do you sing that song? Rejoice. In the Lord always. (laughs) And I say it again. Rejoice. Or do you go, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Exactly. Rejoice. And a, uh uh-huh, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. That's how you do it. It's different. It's fresh. It's beautiful. In the midst of everything, there's a different song. While you walk, why would Paul say always? While you walk, there's a different song. Citizenship actually means representation. Um, of a government, of the kingdom that you represent. Citizenship means living in that government where you're at at all times. It's actually in this text, even though in English it doesn't, looks like, it doesn't look like it. If we were all Greeks and or living in Philippi, we would understand what Paul is saying because the word conduct or conduct or however you say it in English, whatever happens, conduct yourselves. That word conduct in the Greek actually means live as a citizen. Interesting, huh? See, Paul was picking up on something that Philippi had a great proud, uh, was very proud of. It was a gorgeous place. And it was a home to many retired Romans who served in the Senate, had served in the government, and who served in the army, and generals, and they would come to this gorgeous place, and they would buy these cliffside homes, and they would live, and they tended to be frivolous partiers. And so, from the Roman government was a treatise to them, live as citizens of Rome, even if you're on the outskirts in the town, in the city of Philippi. In other words, be proud citizens of Rome and don't embarrass Rome by living frivolously and being murderous and being liars, but carry the pride of Rome. So Paul is jumping off of that for the city, and he says, Christians, conduct yourselves, be a citizen, be a citizen of heaven. Later on in In just a short phrase, in chapter 3, verse 20, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And he carries this through the whole book. Who is your citizen? Where is your citizenship? Be aware of it. Be aware of it at all times. And then he says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of your citizenship in heaven. Represent your country well. What does it mean to represent the kingdom of heaven well. 
one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, one of those chapters that you meditate on for a year straight, First John chapter 4, has all kinds of words about how to live representing your citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Verse uh, 16b, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Living in love? Yeah, that's representing your country well. See, there are some incredible weapons that the world around us uses. Intimidation, slander. Just go, just go on Facebook, right? Or just r- watch the news, any, any of the networks, and, and you'll, you'll get caught up in this almost this hate speak, right? And yet the challenge to Christians is live in love. How do you do that? Well, if you're a child of the king, you have God in you and he flows from within you like a stream of living water. And what does he flow through? What does he bring? What's his river look like? Love. It's love. It's not the kind of love that sits down and lets everybody slap you around. It's a kind of love that is confident. In fact, in verse uh, 18, it says, there is no fear in love. In other words, it's not anxious love, and it's not love that wants everybody to, to love you. It's love that's confident in who God is, confident of your eternity, confident that tomorrow, if you die, you go to heaven. Confident that heaven is real. Confident that the truth of God is real. Confident that the words he gives us in his written word is real. Confident that when you touch somebody with the love of Christ, you aren't just touching them with your own hands. You're touching them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Confidence in the realness of a resurrected and ascended Jesus Christ who has filled you with the stream of living water. That's love. That is love. That's living in love. That's representing God. It says right here, God is love. And when he fills his ambassadors who go out into the world, he doesn't just say, okay, I'm love. Now you go try and make up your own love. No, he floods into his ambassadors. He floods into his people with himself. And so when you touch and live and walk with the song of love. It is him in you. And when you touch people with the Holy Spirit, you are actually touching them with the very love of Christ and the very presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the incredible thing of representing the kingdom of heaven as you walk and as you live. Now let's keep going. Citizenship means representation in this way. Look at these words. Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, Paul is saying to this church, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit. Whether he's here or whether he isn't, he's saying to them, represent your country well. This is, he's talking about something I'd like to call environmental faith. That means um, when you're in a particular environment, you act according to that environment. So when you're at church, well, of course, you'll conduct yourself worthy of the kingdom of heaven as a citizen of heaven. But what happens when you're not here? What happens when the, the, when the cat's w- away, the mice will play? What happens when the apostle Paul isn't around, right? What happens when we're hanging with a group of guys at at work, then the language is flying. What happens when we don't have to be face-to-face with people, but we're just typing our emotional responses? What happens when we get tempted to, to, to not represent the kingdom of heaven because we're not thinking about who we really are? Environmental faith means Don't let your environment determine your faith. Let the kingdom of God be real 
no matter what environment you're in. Let's go on. So how then can I be a good citizen? This is what Paul says. Then whether I come and see you and, or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm. Stand firm in one spirit. Stand firm. So really this front end, the, the whole call to represent the kingdom of heaven in whistling the song in the midst of darkness is to stand firm. Stand firm on what you believe. Stand firm that the love of Christ is real. You know, um, there, there's a transition that needs to happen in us. Um, where we don't just rely on the super Christians anymore. Uh, we don't rely on the, on the preacher or we don't rely on the, on the people that, you know, that really get it. But all of us, all of us will say, I believe. There's a level of maturity that God calls us to um, and, and Paul says, so that we're neither tossed by the waves or the winds to and fro. But that all of us will be able to say, It's true. God is good. God is love. No matter what. We can say to our, we can say when the, when the difficult things and the darkness in this world comes our way, we'll, we'll be able to say, it's true. God is greater than all of this, that he that is in me is greater than he that is in this world. We could say, I don't want to be tossed all over the place. I'm going to believe what it says here. I'm going to believe this gift of love that God has given us, this written word. I'm going to believe it to be true. I'm not just going to choose the things I like out of it, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make the transition. I'm going to say, I believe it. I believe it's true. may not understand it all. But I'm going to stand firm in who God is and that he would not lie to me. There's a level of maturity that needs, needs to happen. One, one of the difficult things about the consumer church is that um, we think that being a Christian is going and sitting in, in, a, in a church and then it's all about what they can provide me and then we go and we live our lives. But church isn't, Christianity and the American church isn't necessarily what being a Christian is all about. Being a Christian is belonging to the kingdom of heaven. Church is awesome, but it's not about you, it's about him. It's not about me, it's about him. It's about him. And there's a step of maturity that says, okay, I'm going to step into who he is. And I'm going to stand firm on that. I'm going to stand firm at work. I'm going to stand firm at school. When things get tough, I'm going to actually choose to trust him. When finances are tough, I'm going to actually choose to trust him. When he puts me in a place and I walk with him in that place, I'm actually going to choose to trust him in this place. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to stand firm. Because he is love and his motivations in our lives is present in love. And he can walk us through anything. Stand firm in one spirit, meaning that you're not alone. That if you choose to become a person that has a character and a manner of standing firm on the truth of who the living God is, no matter what, there are others around you that are doing the same thing. And they've got the same heart and the same spirit. And then he says, striving as one man for the faith of the gospel. You don't have to back down from what Christ gave you. There's so many strong opinions in our world. I uh, spent some time with some young adults not too long ago. And I mean, we had this incredible um, few days together. And uh, that we were, we were experiencing the incredible movement and the grace of God 
and they were making commitments. These are post high school, making commitments to Christ. And then they went back into, in, and I didn't see them for another year. And I heard stories of how they came from the mountaintop and they went back into school and a couple of them just completely forgot everything that they had just experienced and who giving their lives and their souls and their hearts and making decisions and commitments to live and to walk as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And they just backed down from everything that Christ gave them. And slowly the Lord Jesus started to pull them back in and to remind them. So I, 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 think, I think as you walk from this place today, I, we'll be tempted just to back down and whistle a song of, of the words of this world around us, but I'm challenging you today, don't back down. Stand firm. Finally, as the worship team begins to rally around us again this morning. Paul ends it this way, and I, I titled it, this, Don't Let the Bad Guys Get You Down. Just whistle in the dark. This is how Paul says it. Uh, his words, of course, are so much more beautiful. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, and he says this, without being intimidated in any way by those who oppose you. And it may mean some suffering. Look at the last highlighted section. You may have to suffer like Paul, but there is a, there's a few tools that the devil has. First, he likes to flatter you, and, and he does this by making you feel like, man, um, uh, you alone are incredible, and he flatters you, and he, when, when you say, oh, man, I am pretty incredible, um, he's got you, right? And then, and then once he's got you, he makes you feel guilty about things. And, or he intimidates you, and he says, you can't do that, or you are a hypocrite. You can't represent Jesus or you can't really ever step into full Christian maturity because of those things you did, or he intimidates you. And after he's done intimidate you, he'll slander you. And after he's done slandering you, he'll threaten you. And after he's done threatening you, he will exert rage at you. And he just wants to shut you down. It's what the world does. This is the tactics they use. But you, you have dual citizenship. And when the intimidation comes your way, you know. You know, and you know that you know that you know. Because of the presence of the resurrected, ascended Lord Jesus Christ, he is real. He is alive. This is not just a religious exercise. This is the king. And he reigns and he rules. And what's more, he's filled you with his love by the presence of his spirit. And you do not need to be intimidated. Because you are. You are loved now and forevermore. And the words that he's given you are true. No matter what anybody says. Whistle. Whistle. Whistle boldly, whistle without fear, whistle firmly that the love of Christ is real within you. And let the dark just be healed as the light of your words flow through the air and heal the world around. I'd like to stand and, and to end our service knowing that the song that we whistle is a song of hope and freedom and grace. But in order for that song to pierce through the air, the chains that 
keep us from whistling it. We need to just be broken and fall away. How does that happen? Love. Love. For God so loved you that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Heal us, Jesus. Give us the whistle. Give us the song. In Jesus' name. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. 